Thank you. To understand the Hinduism's approach to sexuality, I have divided my presentation on the three themes. Firstly, what is Hinduism? References from the Hindu texts with relevance to present time, showcasing the inclusivity and the way forward. Look at this image. This looks like a family photograph of father, mother, and two sons. But this is no ordinary portrait. It is Lord Shiva with his wife, Goddess Parvati, and his two children, Ganesha with the elephant face, and Kartike who holds the spear. An outsider who may be not familiar with Hinduism may find this image as strange. How can these be gods? But for Hindus, they accept these images. The Hindu notion of divine is unique. It is given form and not restricted to a single idea. They are gods and goddesses who are individually pieces of puzzle called God. If I go by the Western definition, then Hinduism is one of the oldest religion and the third largest in the world. But according to the Hindus, it's not exactly a religion. And that is why I quote from the Apex Court of India. India has one of the highest number of Hindus living uh, in any country. The definition of Hinduism is such. Unlike other religions in the world, the Hindu religion does not claim any one prophet. It does not worship any one god. It does not believe in any one philosophical concept. It does not follow any one act of religious rites or performances. In fact, it does not satisfy the traditional features of a religion or creed. It is a way of life and nothing more. This faith is also very subjective, allows for an individual perspective and interpretation. The basic hope of Hinduism is that every individual soul, atma, should realize and find the ultimate truth in their own unique way across different rebirths. The physical life and the individual atma realize ultimate truth and the circle of life and gets over as soul becomes one with the source. Unlike other faiths which divides into mind and body, the Hindu belief believes in tradition of many bodies. So as per the diagram, you can see there's a gross body, which is the physical body, the subtle body, which is, represents mind, intellect, or emotions, the causal body, which carries the samskar, or the past record, a record of unfulfilled desire, aspirations of previous lives, and atma, or soul, is an independent, neutral body. The term which we call death, it falls under the gross body. The soul survives with the subtle and the causal body till all samskars or the unfulfilled desires and aspiration of previous lives are consumed. And according to Hinduism, man must take rebirth again and again till all these samskars are consumed. And one can only consume this in a human form, and hence, in Hinduism, the human life is considered extremely important from the point of liberation. We have to note that the, these fact of multiple tradition, somehow, the, uh, what you have, the causal body, which brings in the past record, influence the present intellect, emotions, and uh, uh, mind of a person. I give other features of Hinduism. It's basically the whole mythology of stories in Hinduism uses gender as a vehicle to communicate metaphysics. Also in Hinduism, love is regarded as an eternal force. It is seen as devotion between two people, whether romantic or platonic. Hindus believe that love and devotion are important in attaining moksha or liberation from the cycle of rebirths. Erotic desire or karma in Hinduism had been one of the most legitimate pleasures on earth, 
thus accounting for the vast number of erotic treatises, poetry, and sensual sculptures of ancient India. One of the very famous examples is of Kama Sutra. All these facts, the fact that it is a way of living, it is very subjective, it explains things that can't be explained through many traditions of multiple bodies and other features make Hinduism very inclusive. Let me show with the basic. If you talk about trinity of energy, then the masculinity is balanced with the femininity. If Brahma is a god that is the, who is the creator, then it's balanced by Saraswati with knowledge. If Vishnu is a preserver or sustainer, then it's balanced by Lakshmi with wealth. And if Shiva, Lord Shiva is the destroyer, then it's balanced by Shakti with power. Let me show another example of Ardhanareshwar. This is a half woman god. Shiva, Lord Shiva says that he's incomplete without the goddess, meaning that the spiritual re reality, which is usually shown in masculinity, is incomplete without the material reality, Shakti. It is in Hinduism that only through material reality that we can realize the spiritual reality. And this god, Ardhanareshwar, the half-woman god, is worshipped across even and present times in India. And to your right, you can see one of the biggest statue that happens to be in South Africa. Very interesting example is of Mohini, the female form of Vishnu, Krishna, but male in a sense. So Mohini is a spiritual reality soaked in material world and needs to enchant Shiva out of his spiritual stupor to the material world, because as I said, material and spiritual world are interdependent. And in the story it goes that though Shiva knows that Mohini is Vishnu, but Vishnu, but male in his sense, even then gets enchanted by her. This is an image, and one doesn't know why these two goddesses come together, but these are worshipped in western part of India. Chamundi Chotila, we don't know if they are sisters, twins, or companions. If I go to the earliest text, the Rig Vedas from the Indus civilization, then it says in Sanskrit, Vikriti evam prikriti, meaning what seems even unnatural is also natural. But some scholars believe recognizes homosexual and transsexual dimensions of human life, like all forms of universal diversity. Even in the famous Kama Sutra book, it states that homosexual sex is to be engaged in and enjoyed for his own sake as one of the arts. In the present times, we have this goddess Bahuchara Mata, which is prayed to by all Indians and happens to be a patron to the transgender community, or in subcontinent, they're called the Hijra community. The celebrations of Bhauchara Mata is participation of not only the Hijras, but in the community, the elders and the children, even as present time. This is a picture from Karachi. There's a very interesting story that when Lord Ram came from 14 years of exile, what he found was a group of people still waiting for him. Seeing their loyalty and dedication, Lord Ram grants Hijra the boon to confer blessings on people during auspicious inaugural occasions like childbirth and weddings. And this what is called Badai in India and it's celebrated across the subcontinent in which the Hijra, the transgender community, dance and give blessings. Even as of today, the major community of India believe that the Hijra community are messengers of God and their blessings bring good fortune. There's another famous temple in south of India of Lord Aravan in Tamil Nadu. It is during the festival that Aravanis, the people who believe in this God, reenact the story of the wedding of Lord Krishna or Vishnu, Mohini, and Lord Aravan, followed by Lord Aravan's subsequent sacrifice. The community gets dressed up as brides 
to get married to Lord Aravan, and then subsequently, they mourned the death of this god through ritualistic dances and by breaking the bangle. This is a very major festival in south of India. Lord Aravan is not just a patron to transgender community, but by, played by the Hindus. Uh, if I go to the commercial sex, how it was, then there was a lot of respect in earlier times. There was Devdas' system, the courtesan system. Of course, things have changed and there are laws to protect them now. If I really have to see that what has really depicted these traditions of inclusivity in India is the art literature, and in present times, the Indian movie, which is a very big scenario in the Indian subcontinent. The life of courtesans, or today how we call them as commercial sex workers, has been glorified in these movies where top actresses and enacted their roles. Movies like Pakiza, Umrao Chan, and others have become classic movies of the Indian cinema. The same thing has been depicted through media literature art about the transgender. Hijras have been part of the movie scene, and it is not unusual to see the top actors of Indian movies cross-dress. Even the homosexual relation has been portrayed. It's not latest, it's been there in literature as well as media. Then why, in spite of all this inclusivity, that we still have problems, criminalization? The reason is the Victorian Law 377, which was enforced under the British colonial rule in 1861, which criminalizes sexual activity against the order of nature. And unfortunately, we still have it. Luckily, in 2009, the Delhi High Court actually uh, declared it unconstitutional. But again, in 2013, December, the Supreme Court, the top apex court of India, overturned it, saying that this is a matter for the parliament to discuss. So the agitation still go on. We had one respite. In April 2014, the Supreme Court of India uh, gave recognized the transgender as the third gender category with similar legislation in the in subcontinent countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. In spite of 377, since more than a decade, we still have gay parades across major cities of India, and the numbers are growing in these parades. They are not only the parades, but they are queer film festivals held in major metropolitan cities of India. When it comes to the faith Hindu leaders, they have been actively participating in sensitizing this, themselves to the HIV issues and the issues faced by the key population. Dialogue also has happened at the Asia-Pacific level and the participation from the Hindu faith has not been less. They have also been part of the safe toolkit developed by Inarella. And as I end my presentation on the positive note, recently in May 2014, some of the top leaders of the Hindu faith, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar Swami Egnivesh, signed the Declaration of Faith Against Homophobia. Thank you. <laughs>